Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Humor in the C-Suite. My guest this week is M. Shroud. She's a comic coach who speaks on a range of subjects, including how laughter and fun impact the leadership, teams, and culture. How tools and ideas from the world of improvisation, comedy, and clowning can impact business success and team performance, as well as the leadership. Shroud is a best-selling author, clown, and successful entrepreneur who has been described as innovative, witty, engaging, and authentic, and I can double down on all those things. She is a host of two podcasts, Funny Yet Deep and Simply Feel Better. She has done two TEDx talks, uh, including one dressed as a banana, and M explores the relationship between culture within organizations and the human element. How can we collaborate more successfully and shift our own personal choices when it comes to engagement, communication, impact? and storytelling and comes from having worked with a compelling list of previous teams, senior individuals and leadership groups and companies, including Bloomberg, Bear and Barclay Card and other firms that do not begin with B like Airbus, King and Fisher German. Uh, We had a great talk and I'm so excited to share her expertise. She's like a soul sister. I swear you guys are going to love this episode. So please welcome M. Shroud. What? Hello, Em. How Hello. are you? I'm really good. Thank you very much. It's a joy to be chatting to you. Thank you. Oh, my me. God. You are my first international uh, guest. Across oh, the I now feel the pressure. I should I should have brought a cup of tea, <laughs> some Marmite, and maybe just have the king walking past me. I now, I now feel a slight level of pressure. You no, know, I'm like, where is he? Where? No, that was yeah. really bad. I'm like Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. That was, that I'm was so a little sorry. bit Dick Van Dyke. And, it's like, and you know, what's really scary is that Dick Van Dyke is still alive. I mean, God, oh, yeah. brilliant. But he's, yeah. like, he's 98. Yeah, he's not going anywhere. He's still no. dancing, that guy. I know. I, but... You know, there is an example of follow your passion, have joy in your life, and you'll live a better life, you know? Absolutely. Although I did have an aunt who lived to 99, mm. Aunt Netta, and she smoked until she was 98. And then she said she didn't feel like it anymore. And just like, she just watched poker really late at night. Up smoking. Oh my God. And then I go over and she'd make me like smoke salmon sandwiches, which was just like, Bread with a slab of butter and, and, oh, Mm -hmm. really, you know, so sometimes you just got good genes. (laughs) But also I bet because she just liked it, she was happy with it. You know, I remember like one of my, this tangent, but I remember one of my first ever jobs when I was 13 was I worked in an old people's home in the UK and there was a couple of them who were completely on it just physically they were just a bit too unwell to live by themselves and there was one and her name was Dottie and she had a room that was literally surrounded by clocks so you went in and there was just all these second hands and you'd go in and she'd be like it's time for sherry dear and I'd be like (laughs) firstly I'm 13 secondly it's 10 a.m and she went well I'm not going to be around for that much longer, so I'm just going to enjoy it. And she said she'd been drinking little bits of sherry during the day since when she was a teenager. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Well, it worked, Dottie. It worked. It worked. Uh, well, welcome to Humor in the C-Suite. I'm so excited to have you as a guest just because uh, we are so parallel in different universes. Um, because I went to acting college, so did you. Uh, mm-hmm. You went more into clowning. I went more into an improv. I went really mm-hmm. into stand up. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of, but I'm just fascinated. You've done so much. You've had hit podcasts, number one uh, best selling books. Um, so I thought we'd just start off and tell the people who you are. Okay. Who's M. Stroud? Who's M. Stroud? So uh, I'm the comic coach. So I do comedy in various different guises. And my new one woman show that's just about to be uh, happening in December in London, in the West End, uh, is called The M Show. How did I come up with the name? Uh, Tales from a Little Laughing Lesbian. So it's probably the closest, uh, it's probably the closest to a show that I've ever done that's a mixture of stand up, impro, and clowning. So I do that on one side. So I still professionally perform. I've had sellout runs at the West End and Edinburgh Festival and things. And then I also have the other side of me is that I've spent 20 plus years working in the world of businesses and really helping leaders in particular create more impact. And what I love to do is 
just give them that permission of how can we have more impact and how can we have more joy and how can we be memorable? And it's sort of pulling probably similar to yourself. It's pulling together all of my different worlds, you know, and I was trained coach and done various different businesses and just kind of going, just be you. And it's not about people having to become hilarious or stand up on stage and do comedy like you and I, but it's about how can we be all of ourselves? So in the business world, um, that's that's what I do. And that's what I've been playing in for the last 20 odd years. Uh, I've got a little kid. He's not that little. He's taller than me because I'm five foot two and a half and he's now 12. <laughs> uh, and I have a dog called Charlie. So in a nutshell, and tomorrow, so this will get a timestamp on it. Tomorrow I fly to Australia. There you go. There's a little oh bit. Oh my there. gosh. Are you going to Australia for shows or are no, you? No, I am going on holiday. Wow. Stop it. I know. So my lovely other half, she she is Australian. And so we're going to go out and go and see some of her family and do a little bit of that stuff. And then we're going to go out and go on boats and go up to the Sundays and basically practice what I preach. Because how Aww. can I work with leaders if I don't go and look after myself? That's it. That is yeah. absolutely it. I love where you come from. And I, I love what you say, because it's really giving permission for people mm-hmm. to be themselves. What I found, um, and I don't know if you found when you're coaching uh, in the C-suite, um, it's really them trusting in, in the fact that humor has that power to really mm. connect people. Mm. Um, and whether it's, and I'm not talking about telling the next best joke. I'm really talking about, you know, it's an, you know, um, I read somewhere it's an elixir to trust and an antidote to arrogance. Mm. And and yeah. really uh, taking, how do you get uh, C-suite leaders to really trust what you're coaching in when it comes to humor? I think, I think it's that thing of reminding people in the C-suite that they're human, and because when they're when they're out in their normal day to day lives, there will be certain points with their wives, with their partners, with their kids, with their friends, where they will have a lightness and touch and a levity and they will do that. And I think quite often what happens is that people get higher and higher up in the food chain, you know, in the corporate world. And it's like, yeah. okay, great. Now I've made it. Now I'm in the C suite. Yeah. And quite often they've in essence, put masks on. So it's like, this is what's required. This is who I need to be. This is what I am. And this is what success looks like. And that's great. And it gets those people to that place. But then in order to shift it so that you can be memorable, so that people can really connect with you, so you can inspire, motivate, engage, all of those good things. Actually, when you can play a little bit more with your whole range of humanity, Mm. it's extraordinary how when you have to be direct and clear or upbeat and motivational when you've expanded that range it's amazing what can happen of course so how I get people there is just to first come in to themselves and go when you're in a really good place and you're really relaxed do you like laughing and there isn't one executive that's gone no (laughs) which is good because otherwise that'd be a terribly opening a terrible open gamut so you know so it's that thing right yeah you go, okay, so you know that you like laughing and how does it make you feel? And they're like, well, I feel more present. I feel everything else like that. I'm like, okay, cool. And sometimes it's not about trying to elicit laughter because that might not be appropriate because you might be doing some serious, you know, KPIs and all of those other business jargons that we could use. But what it is about is how do we bring more levity? How do we bring that lightness? And yeah. for every single person that I work with, just same as it is for you, Kate, it will be different, but it's about finding your own true way of doing that. And for some people, it's literally as simple as when you click join, smile, you know, when you click join on a Zoom call, it's like yeah. be smiling. And people are like, oh yeah, I don't really think about that because they're going from one <laughs> meeting to a next, to a next, to a yeah, next. Absolutely. And, then, and it's, you know, so for me, it's that thing of just opening the door and kind of going, how do you want to be remembered? And when you think of legacy, Yes. execs understand that they want to leave legacy and actually yes. it's like what does that look like you know and as soon as you kind of go oh yes I do like laughing oh yeah I do see the benefit in it then then you can then play you know yeah absolutely I love everything you just said do you have a favorite joke you like to tell <laughs> see I saw this <laughs> I saw this and I said I was I actually found one of my friends I was like, I'm gonna go on this this podcast I'm really looking forward to it and they asked me to tell my favorite joke <laughs> And this mate, she's known me for, since I was 16. She's like, you don't tell jokes. I'm like, I know. I mean, I do comedy. I tell stories. So my yeah. only joke, my only joke. Are you ready? This is my only joke, yeah. Kate. I'm going to tell you my actual joke. I'm okay. in. I mean, sorry. Okay. Uh, so just lower lower expectations, lovely listeners, mm. and lower that. Okay. Ask me if I'm an orange. Are you an orange? No. <laughs> 
as I said, lower expectations. Uh, I don't tell jokes. I do comedy as a living, but I don't tell jokes in a traditional joke form. So there you go. Yeah, That's my best it's, joke. It's been so interesting hearing because so many C-suite people are like, uh, I, I only have dirty ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, it's not a clean podcast. You're fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're fine. Uh, but they're all like, no, no. They might see it on LinkedIn. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> cannot be known for saying that joke. No, 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 no. Or like real, like childhood jokes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's just such a funny way for me to, uh, to, uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. And I love the fact you don't have one. No. <laughs> Soz about that. Absolutely. You could ask me many questions about many different things. I'd be like, yeah, I've got something. I've got something. Ask me a joke. No. And and just for everyone listening, if you don't know M, uh, you can check out her TEDx uh, where she is banana the entire I, time. I am. <laughs> and that is, it's a great talk. I loved Thank it. You. Yeah. Thank you. So much fun. And, you know, people were pretty, taking the banana pretty seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, people, it, it was sort of odd and, you know, and I'll, I'll let your listeners go and go and watch it, but it's, it was sort of odd, you know, because this all stemmed from me spending a day walking around London dressed as a banana, you know, and yeah. it's, and I'm not a threatening banana, you know, I'm quite a cool, gentle banana, uh, but it's, yeah, and it, it's an extraordinary thing that when you allow yourself to play, it's extraordinary where things end up because I never knew that on the day that I went to a lunch dressed as a banana, that that would then end up leading me down a route where, you know, I ended up doing a TED talk that's then, you know, and all of these different yeah. things. And it's, you know, it's just that permission to play piece, right? Uh, you look, the weirdest gig I ever had uh, mm. as was as a comic is I, I did a show for a pharmaceutical company and they okay. wanted me, the only way they were going to give me the gig, and it was dumb money at that point in my life. I was like, I got to do this. I'm getting a hundred bucks. Uh, <laughs> not a beer ticket. What? Yeah. Um, and they were like, they made me dress up as a syringe and I had to do my entire comedy set as a syringe. I swear. I'm not making this up people. I, I swear. I believe you. I believe you. And you know that somebody in marketing, hello, I'm Roger from marketing. Wouldn't it be brilliant if the comic was as a syringe yeah. and you know that that person was genuinely really proud of the fact that they came up so with that proud. idea. But literally, and I did it because I just, I have three kids. I needed the money. Yeah. I need the $100, <laughs> man. <laughs> I've got to do this. Oh, my God. So I love the fact. Lessons from a banana and, and where life takes you when, you know. Exactly. You just don't mind being a little goofy and having a little bit of fun. I love that. Do you find when you're, um, because now, other than a best-selling author, and, and so you just finished one podcast. Mm -hmm. which was your clowning around, but you have another one called yep. feeling. It's, it's called the comic coach, uh, how to have impact in life and leadership. I love it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, and clowning around is still there. I think it's over 250 episodes. It's had tens of thousands of downloads across the world and there's some awesome guests, but we're creatives, right? And yeah. there comes a point where, you know, that podcast had served me and my listeners unbelievably well, but I was like, you know what? It's time to take a breath and yeah. just shift into my next iteration, my next stage of life. So I'm, I'm very proud of the fact I just used the word iteration. I don't oh. know where that came from. Kate, you are bringing out the big guns of vocab I didn't know I had. Well, you did start off with an alliteration so I, woo, she's good this girl is on fire woo. do you find when you were in the corporate environment um mm -hmm. everything you learned from that like how do you how do you de-risk humor for your ceos and and people in the c-suite who might be apprehensive about it everybody has to feel safe yeah safety is absolutely at the heart of every piece of work I do because for me one of the big journeys that I've had as a human as both as a performer as a coach but first and foremost as M is how do I make sure that I feel safe because if I feel safe then that's the thing that I'm in charge of and then when it comes down to holding a group of senior execs and the c-suite they have to feel safe and I think with humor there are, of course, there are different lines, you know, and if you're using, there's a big difference between the humor that you can use 
around a board table to the humor that you might say to a room of people that are on uh, hen and stag days, bachelorette parties, right? There's going to be a difference. But for me and my type of humor is uh, I'm naturally kind and I will never utilize, I'm very quick, but I will never utilize that quickness with anything other than kindness. And if you're encouraging people to experience to experiment and to play with something that's so vulnerable making because for a lot of people there's a stigma about humor in the workplace or for a lot of people they're scared about getting it wrong and being offensive and for a lot of people it's like I don't think I'm allowed to do this so there's all of these different rules, some of which, which are true. Which is so interesting because research has actually shown that mm-hmm. humor, people who use humor are probably more likely to get that promotion faster. Yep, I know. You know and so that's that's the really, yeah. weird, you know, that's the, it's, it's the sort of the dichotomy of the business, well, within the West, how the Western world do business. It's like, oh, I've got to be very serious and we've got mm-hmm. to do this and this is, and then as long as I'm very serious, then you will buy into me. And actually, when that rule book was made of this is how we do business, that was made when we started the Industrial Revolution, where there had to be things of safety. And, you know, well, there wasn't any safety, but it was it was a different time. And it feels, I mean, the very fact that you and I are talking and you are doing a podcast called Humor in the C-Suite demonstrates that there is a an openness and a curiosity that I think is starting to emerge across all sectors of well, let's face it, we all spend a lot of time at work. And if we're not finding the fun and the joy, what are we doing? And when you think about from a C-suite perspective, in order to get the really awesome younger generations to come in, they rightly care more about culture, how does stuff feel, who actually inspires them. And if you are not finding a way to engage and motivate them, they'll leave. So actually humor is an important tool, I believe, to understand and use respectfully in a way to help make sure that you get brilliant teams. I, yes, absolutely. Uh, You know, when people are happy, you get staff retention. You know, Mm -hmm. people aren't leaving. They want to stay. They want to, you know, it's it's pretty incredible. And just the collaboration that comes Mm -hmm. along with it when people are, like it really does, do you find it helps with team collaboration? Oh, completely. You know, like when it was really interesting. I was, I was doing a, I did a, a keynote to about 800 people in, in the UK and they were all in the housing sector and the housing sector in the UK, like everywhere, sort of pretty much in the West has been, has had a tough old time recently. And I was talking about the benefits of laughing and how we can play more and things like that. And one CEO came up to me and she said, you know what, you've really made me think. We had this guy, I think his name is Robin from memory. We had this guy called Robin and he was our, he was our funny one. He was the one that kept it all light. He would remind us to, you know, bring in, you know, and he'd bring in sort of fun things and occasionally he'd do a practical joke and he was just like this delicious man. And she said, and he left three months ago and it's only now seeing you talk that I can now associate and I've now worked out the reason that everybody feels flat is because we haven't replaced Robin. And no one else has stepped up into that place. So she said, everything just feels quite flat. The business is doing okay. And it is that thing of going, how do we make sure that we all contribute to creating kind of the culture with a nice sort of sense of lightness, you know? Yeah. And there are so many ways to actually do that, Mm. you know, and as you said, it's not about telling the next best joke. It's really about bringing that levity into the workplace. So how do you, when you're coaching people, how are you doing that to get them to do things like that? I think at the heart of how I practice, it's about helping people really reconnect to to play. You know, as you mentioned, you know, I'm an improviser and a clown. And one of the things that I've been really researching is, you know, how as adults do we play? And generally, when I say to a bunch of adults, especially C-suites, we're going to play, I'm met with a, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> oh, no, and no doubt you've had it, you know, and then yeah. you put your syringe outfit on and they're fine. And it's like, oh, she's fine. She's a syringe. We can trust her now. I actually had a coach tell me a brilliant thing recently because I had to do a three-hour workshop with mm-hmm. 10 C-suite people. And when I'm in those environments, it's I can't use comedy. It's so much pressure on them to laugh. Like where I, you know, if I'm in a big crowd, I'll do stand up, you know, I'll I'll pepper that in. So it was impossible in this environment. And I said, I am like, 
what happens if they don't want to play, if they don't want to do anything? And she was so great. She said, it's like, uh, going, you gotta, you gotta squeak in your car. It's driving you crazy. You go to the shop and then the squeak doesn't happen. You're like, Oh, there really is a squeak. She's like, you want the squeak to happen. You want people to eye roll. You want people to be uncomfortable Mm -hmm. because that's what we're teaching. Absolutely. Right. And if they weren't yeah. uncomfortable, then so yeah. what you just said is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think there's there's so much weight in that, because actually the thing is, is that for a lot of adults, it's because they're scared. And when I walk in and there's deep resistance and some, you know, somebody who's the slightly out there person on the team have met me or have seen me speak and gone, oh, OK, Em's credible. She's got she knows her stuff. And then I'll walk in and you can see that there's three or four people going, I don't really want to be here. This is going to be a waste of time. This is not going to serve me. Don't you know how busy I am? I'm very important. All of that stuff. And you can see it and you can feel it. But actually underneath all of that is I'm terrified. I might not actually know what I'm doing. And I believe that there's a real, please don't make me look stupid. I'm really out of my comfort zone. And because I'm so out of my comfort zone, I'm going to meet you with defensiveness and resistance. And for me, when I when I reframed how I would deal with, dare I say, it, slightly more challenging folk, as soon as, again, as soon as I thought, saw it through the lens of kindness, I had no desire, and it's not about me, and that's the piece, right? I always say, you know, just take what lands with you. You know you best. And even if it's just one thing, which could be that simple thing of I'm going to smile when I click on join, take the things that are going to land with you. But it takes bravery to show up to a workshop with people like you and I, because you and I have been standing up on stages and making people laugh and they feel there's that, there's, they have that imposter syndrome that other people have with them. Oh, but you're the CFO. I better not. And they're suddenly like, oh, hang on. I'm meeting Kate. Kate's comedian. Kate's done this. Oh gosh. So it's the same thing, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I do find um, the culture are, they're changing in our favor. Yeah. That's how I feel. They know they have to lighten up in yeah. order to, you know, take that risk to be more responsive, to, you know, allow creativity in, to reimagine their work culture. Because, you know, I have kids in their 20s and 30s now, and they have great boundaries mm-hmm. <laughs> where I was just like, yes, sir. <laughs> Whatever you say. Give me the syringe outfit. I'm there. (laughs) Exactly. And they're not, they're not, they're not buying it. You're right. So there are lots of ways. So uh, do you have ways that, you know, simple ways that you can, that you're helping people bring humor into their corporations that they can do? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do different ways because as you know, you know, humor is so individual specific, I guess, you know, things that I do as a sort of universal is that once they've experienced and felt some joy and some levity and played a bit, I'll always share with them certain games that they can then try with their team. Uh, I'll always give them more insight. You know, and one of the things that people love is like, I've never even realized that there could be different ways that we all play. And as soon as you know that, you suddenly go, oh, okay. I mean, I remember once, so one of the ways that people play is um, the organizer, right? This is not how I play. And these are the people that love Excel spreadsheets and who love putting (laughs) things together. Quite often love the spreadsheets more than they do the actual event that they're organizing, to use it as an example. And I was showing the 12 ways that we play at an event. And I kid you not, this woman stood up, and this was the last of the 12 ways that you play that I was sharing. And she stood up and she went, that's it. That's me. I can tell my husband I am fun and I do play. <laughs> <laughs> and then I kid you not, she sat down. She was like, I can't believe that I actually said that. And she came up to me afterwards and she was like, I find that so joyful. I'm present and I'm smart, you know, and it's that yeah. thing now. Is that how I play? No. But for her, and it's that thing of, and I guess for all of us, it's just about remembering, you know, for some people, that idea of going to the, I don't know, going to the bar and having a dinner with all of the work, that's not fun for some people, whereas for some that is. So as leaders, one of the things that I ask is, how do you make sure that you are providing different opportunities that tick different people's idea of what fun might look like? Yeah. And they go, yeah, you're right. 
and quite I remember working with a company. It was quite a male company. This will not come as a surprise. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we've only ever offered a golf day. And I was like, uh, how many of your uh, uh, how many I know women do play golf, of course. And I was like, but how many of your women actually play golf? And he was the CEO was like, two? And I went, yeah. Do we think we can? And he went, you're completely right. And he changed it and he just went, okay, we need to do different things. So they created and it's, and it's, there's nothing wrong with golf, but it's yeah. that thing about, yeah. I guess, spending the time thinking about how you craft these different situations. So we come in, we share ideas and then they yeah. take their own ownership, right? Oh, absolutely. Are, are you, have you ever had like a misstep with humor? Where you're just like, oh, that did not go well. Okay, there was there was <laughs> there was the closest to the biggest misstep I've ever had. So I was doing a an impro show, and I was comparing it, and it was it was my troupe, and there was a an awful, awful sort of in essence serial killer in the UK, but they hadn't found this person, and a couple of the younger performers started to recreate. So it was still not been solved. There were still people being killed. It was still really awful. And they started to make a scene about it. And you know when you feel, and you'll know this, right? You know when you feel a whole audience going, oh, this is not funny <laughs> yeah. because this is, this is no. And there was that moment where I was like, we are losing the audience. So I then stepped up onto stage and then went, so there we have the crime recreation of what's going on and turned it into the TV cop show trying to find them. And even that, although I pulled it back, it still was a bit like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, that was that was that was one. Um, and the other know one your room. was know your room. <laughs> and then I had one other where I was doing a part of my own solo show and I'd been invited to perform and in a particular rural part let's say of the united kingdom and part of my show is about talking about being uh you know a gay woman who has a child and there's you know my truth and my stories is all good comedy is based on yeah and i went there and there was a room of about 55 60 people and all of these people were all from south africa and they were all afrikaans now i'm not saying all afrikaans would do this but this particular group in my experience this is how it and i started telling this story and silence was met and then I moved on to the next story, complete silence. And you know, and you've had this, right? And you're sitting there going, this is not my audience. This is not my people. No. They do not approve of me. You know, and at one point I was like, Ellie, have you been single? Silence. I was like, hmm. obviously oh, some of you I... have been single. Okay. Yeah. So I, so I wrapped it up as quickly as I could. And then I stayed to watch the headline act. And the headline act, uh, I, <laughs> the headline act then finished, did his, started doing his stuff. And as I watched him, he was a very, very old school South African comic. And I watched him and went, okay, because they were laughing at everything that was racist, misogynistic, homophobic, and everything in between and past. And it was, and I was like, if that's what you're going to find hot, funny, then I'm okay with the fact that I didn't land. Yeah. But it was the most awful 20 minutes of my life because everything that normally works did not work. And then I yeah. worked out why. So yeah. those, those are the two, you know? And sometimes you just can't connect, you know, yeah. and you can try different ways. You have different stories, you know, we're seasoned comics that we, if I, I, I have, I have room to move within yeah. my comedy act to, course, to make course. it work. But sometimes you just, yeah, sometimes it's better to know that, oh yeah, I'm glad I didn't connect. Mm. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Although, and this wasn't pure comedy, but it, it was one of the funniest experiences on stage I've ever had. So when I just left drama school, <laughs> we went and did a tour around old people's homes, you know, because it's where yeah. you kind of learn and you get paid, right? You know, and um, there were three of us. We went into this particular old people's home and you can tell when you walk in whether it's a good one or a bad one. And this one, we were like, this is not a good one. And they wheeled all of these old dears in, right? And then all of the nurses just left. So you're like, well, you know that it's not great because they're like, brilliant. They're being entertained. Started singing this song and it was like a World War II and it's like, keep young, empty, whatever, right? <laughs> singing this song. And then my colleague, he wasn't wearing a syringe outfit. He was wearing a whole big mother goose outfit. So he was wearing this thing. And we looked out to this audience. Remember, we're just recently finished being trained. Looked out to this audience and went, all of them were fast asleep. Oh, not yeah. one. 
<laughs> all of them. And then we were just like, do we keep going? So we had to go through all this dancing and this dancing and stuff. And then eventually it kind of came to the end and it's like, da-da! And the nurses came in, because they knew. And as the nurses came in, they all started clapping and they were all like, it was brilliant! <laughs> we were oh. just like... You slept all the way through it. So, yeah. Oh, my God. So good. So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the sleepy crowd. Yeah, exactly. The things we do. If my, I, I, yeah. After acting college for me, coming uh, back to North America and stuff, I, I was working as an actor, but it was definitely uh, just so different. Like the sense of humor between the countries is just, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. you know what? I, I feel like the world's smaller because of, you know, just we're doing this right now. Who would have thought? Who would have thought in my day? I <laughs> When I lived in the UK, I didn't even have a telephone. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, was, that was a while ago. Yeah. We've got them now. Stop it. Lots yeah, we have. Yeah. Coffee shops. I know. I've been there. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? I had no idea. Are you, um, when you are, uh, just final few questions, but when you, mm-hmm. you are in the C-suite yep. and you're really, uh, you know, there to, to make a difference with them, is there uh, certain things that you find that have really brought people out of their shell? I know you really mentioned safety within that uh experience yeah. for them yeah i think the simpler the things are the easier it is to help them access their sense of joy their sense of humor and things like that so there's a game that i quite often play quite early on and it's um it's an old impro game and it's it's basically throwing invisible balls around the place you know yeah and what's amazing because of the world that we live in at the moment still at C-suite level, it is predominantly men still, you know, the, we're getting, we're getting more equal, but it's still predominantly yeah. men. And it's amazing when you go, you throw a man, an invisible tennis ball and a basketball, and then maybe a football if there's not a table or whatever. And you just say, you got to pass them around and you just watch them. And then they start to laugh. And then you start upping the kind of ante. If there's 12 of them, you're like, you should be able to do six balls and they start going, okay, fine, let me get. So there's different <laughs> ways in. Yeah. But again, it's so simple, but it's also familiar. And I think right. what that does is also it gets them out of their head and into their bodies. Ah, and I think if there's yeah. something for me that is the... Now, because you and I take that for granted because we went to drama school. We're used to going, okay, we've got to walk around the space for the next three hours. We're going to yeah. feel how does this character move. We're going to spend time with nothing other than our bodies to work out what we're doing. So we're very used to moving into our body, which means that when we're doing shows, whether it's stand-up, improv, whatever, we're, we're very physically there and we're very good at being present. It's really easy for people that have gone through that training to forget that the majority of the world have never experienced that. Yeah, And so you need to get them out of their very big adult heads and get them back into, dare I say, more of their their inner child. It's not about being a child, but it's that thing of when they used to play, they would be in their body. So once you get them in their body, then you've got them and they're more present. And if they're more present, you can share different things, you know? Ah, so good. So good. I love that because so much, we're just always so in our heads now. Yeah. You know, whether we're scrolling, whether we're, it's just, it's so in our heads and, and getting in our bodies, I think really, uh, allows us to experience things in a different way. Mm. Like you said, yeah. which yeah. is so important. Um, is, is there any other tips and advice you, you could share with us about how you're bringing humor and in, into the C-suite? I think a really simple thing, if you are in the C-suite and you're listening to this is make comedy a practice. And what I mean by that doesn't mean that you're going to become a comedian or a comic performer or an improviser or a clown, but every day watch a comedy video that's three, four minutes long and work out what it is that makes you laugh about that. If you've got time, go, okay, why is it that that person makes me laugh? And if you haven't got time, just watch it anyway, because as you get more into the practice of allowing that into your daily life, what will happen is that you'll start to share that more and more with other people. And it becomes contagious because laughing feels good. And there's a whole load of science about what laughing does to our bodies and our brains. It's all good. You can go and read that. 
But actually the piece for me is if you don't make time for fun and for joy, suddenly before you know it, you'll find yourself 80. And I don't want to be in a place where I look back on my life and go, Ray, I sent no more emails. What I want to look back on is, did I have moments of joy, of wonder? And there are so many things that, especially if we're in the C-suite, we can influence, but we have to make it our own practice first. Because if we don't appreciate the value for ourselves, then actually how can we possibly expect the cultures that we're leading to really value it? So it's an individual practice that then I believe that then shifts cultures. So that's what I'd suggest. I love that. I, I do very similar thing because I'm like, you know how they tell you to get in your 10,000 steps a day? Yep. yep. I'm always like, get in your 300 laughs a day. Put on your yeah. funniest videos. There's so much yep. content out there. Watch Cats Falling, one of my favorites. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. How do they do that? How do cats oh. fall? <laughs> Such a way. <laughs> How? How it does it happen? Um, I always love ending the episode of Mm Humor in the C-Suite with uh, the funniest thing that's ever happened to you. Do you have a story you can share? (laughs) Um, hmm, Yes. So there was a moment after giving birth and, you know, I was breastfeeding and everything else like this. And I quite, quite early on when William was quite little, he was with his dad. So I took this, this, you know, this breast pump out with me, but I wasn't going to, because obviously it gets really quite painful and things like this. Right. And so I found myself at the O2, which I'm sure even in Canada, you've heard of, it's a very big, yeah. very, very big venue in London. And um, I decided obviously that it was really important to go and watch Guns N' Roses after about a month after giving <laughs> birth. Right. And there was a moment while I was sitting there and Guns N' Roses, as is their want, were very late starting and stuff. And so because they were really late starting, all of my timings about pumping out this thing, I'd kind of messed up basically. And then I was sitting there with my ex-missus now and I was sitting there going, I'm going to have to gonna have to get the pump out sort of thing. So very discreetly in the O2, I had seats, I wasn't in the standing bit. Yeah. I got, got the little thing on to then start, you know, pumping out the thing. And I may well have forgotten that this pump is actually quite noisy. And at this point in the Guns N' Roses concert, they decided to stop playing. So all you could hear in the whole of the O2 was... <laughs> and gradually all of this, you know, obviously this milk was coming out of me and it was going... <laughs> and I kid you not, about a thousand people were all looking round and I was like, I have to feign that I don't know what it is. Yeah. So there I was. So Guns N' Roses will always remind me of my moment of um, having to pump out breast milk in Guns N' Roses and about a thousand people working out what it was. <laughs> Thanks. That is a great story. Why thank you? And I bet a few a few women there were like, I know what that is. Oh, I mean, <laughs> not a few. This was the thing. I genuinely yeah. think hundreds of people did. And I was like, I'm trying to be so discreet. And I was like, no, uh, there's no discreet, yeah. you know? No. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I love that. What a great way to end it. I am so thrilled to have you on as my first international cross pond guest. And also just everything you're doing to make the world a better place. It really is uh, enlightening and incredible. And I hope we can stay friends. Likewise. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh my God. Thank you so much.